Hello everyone, this is Soul here. I also go by the name Solaris, and I've been working on quite a few projects recently for the podcast. I've been off for about, oh, about a month. Um, lots of things popping up. The COVID schedule with uh, my new schedule for jobs since March. And um, recently I have to announce that a few weeks ago my my cat Elsa passed away and it's been pretty hard to work on things like I used to I I did a lot of streaming video game streaming and I was doing a podcast episode every month and I've fallen behind on that just due to some really tough uh, depression some ups and downs and trying to get myself back on track so If you're wondering why there's only two episodes, well, that's why. Um, I started the Moon Medicine Force as a way to help deal with the issues of trauma or depression or just deal with any experience that is normally very hard to explain to others and come to terms with, such as some people have experience with extraterrestrials, beings, paranormal stuff that they can't just go to a doctor for, and it helps to know that you're not alone. And it also helps to know that you're not alone in the same situation that I'm in. And so, quite recently, this past weekend, it's September, past weekend, first weekend of September, by the way, I did a past life regression healing. And to me, it it's helped a bit. And um, it's helped me come to terms with some of the things I need to realize about myself that apparently we all carry over what some people call baggage of drama. So, yeah, we we carry over all this negative or uh, karmic uh, energy from our previous lives. And sometimes, as humans, we intuitively pick up on it and embody it and kind of, like, internalize it in this never-ending cycle of, of non-release. At least that's what I've experienced. In my past lives, I've been animals, I've been people, and I just want to go over in this episode one of my past lives, the first one that I reviewed. And just a little background, I I, I remember having this reoccurring dream over and over again, and over time I realized that some of the dreams that I was having that reoccurred over and over again, that never changed, that were exactly the same over and over again, those were most likely past life memories that I had. And I want to go over my first life in this episode. It's probably not going to be very long. I just wanted to publish this to make sure that it's documented and that when other people are looking into how to access their past lives, they can basically figure it out or have a gist of what to expect. Um, I went through a psychic sensitive who I actually found through TikTok and found her into Instagram and she does have a website and it is posted in the Moon Medicine Force Discord server. So if you are interested, please join the Moon Medicine Force on Discord, join the server, and you'll find tons of links to whatever you're looking for, whether it's cryptids, psychic stuff with abilities, um, ghosts, demons, angels, stuff like that, and alien races and alien experiences, and a lot of people from the Starseed community have joined the server, so if you are of or curious about the Starseed community, which involves everything extraterrestrial, you can do that. 
were there to help you out, but we also have some people that specialize in Wicca and magic, and I'm slowly learning over time some shamanistic practices, just intuitively and naturally from a guide, not a spirit, but an actual guide. Um, who lives here on Earth. I can cover that in a whole nother episode, which will be mentioned most likely in my episode about my guardian werewolf being, who some people call dogmen, some people call werewolves, I call them wolfen, what have you. I will cover that in another separate episode, but for now, this is an episode about my past life regression. And this one past life, that I had, I had to access my, what they call the Akashic Records. And to do that, you literally have to get in this state of mind, kind of like a meditation, kind of not, kind of like a hypnosis, but kind of not. Just more of like, relax your body, visualize yourself of asking your higher power, your, your higher spirits, your higher guides, whoever resides over you to help you, ask them to help you access your Akashic Records, which it helps to envision it as a library with many, many books available to you to pick and choose which to view. And my first one that appeared to me was a royal blue book. And all my books apparently have just a solid, I would say solid colored leather bound like book but the sides of the paper is golden. And so this was a royal blue book and I had to envision myself opening it and stepping into it, which actually helps because then you're like, okay, I'm stepping into my life, my past life of who and what I used to be. And I want to know and see who who I was around, what I did, you know, just just to learn the lesson that I had learned then. In this, it showed me walking in the snow, but I was placing my hand down into the snow, but it wasn't my hand. I, I remember it was some kind of paw, but my brain was trying to correct it by making me see my hand going into the snow. And this is the other thing I struggle with, is that your brain wants to correct what you're seeing. It wants to fill in the blanks. It wants to uh, fix everything to your perception. Don't let it. Just let everything come to you. Let everything come to you is how you intuitively interpret it and feel it coming into you without your brain trying to make sense of it. You have to just let it come into you. And so what happened was it was like not nighttime, it was probably like early morning. And all I can say is that I was walking for a very, very long time in in some kind of mountainous area. And I was very, very, very hungry. And I felt actual hunger in me. And I actually felt the desperation to find food for my family. And when the psychic sensitive asked me, you know, where is your family? Are they with you? And I said, no, they're mostly dead. They're, um, my one, I, I kept telling her that I want to say, like, my child, even though I was feeling that they weren't a human child, that they were some kind of feline, some kind of cat. And because I had seen the dream before, it was easier to explain what was going on because I was trying to confirm what happened in that dream. And she told me, well, is there anybody else with you? I said, no, I'm alone. And she's like, well, do you have, like, a husband or a wife or, or somebody? And in this section, I actually broke down and cried a bit. 
because it reminded I didn't tell her at the time but it reminded me of what it felt like to lose my cat and how close I was to her and we concluded that I did have a mate at the time I, w- I was a male uh, feline uh, cat big cat and they actually like I just remember that um, that my coat was almost looked like a snow leopard's coat and so when I broke down and was crying I said you know my my mate had died she died and it must have been recent when I was envisioning this it must have been a recent point in time when she passed away and all that was left was a cub that I was taking care of who was mine and I just kept getting the gist of like it that it was a little male cub that he was my son my child but we think of them as like a child type thing so I'm, I'm kind of going to be channeling a bit of my past life for this episode too so if I say we or I I, I mean my past life um, but I was going through the snow by myself and I came across this uh, tent, some kind of tent. I, I can only describe it as some kind of teepee tent, like a Native American teepee tent almost. Um, very thick, uh, I would say, it, it was hard to see the tent a little bit exactly as like the texture or anything. I just saw it as like a bland uh, tan color so I would assume that it's some kind of skin just spread out over a teepee and I just remember digging underneath the flap on the outside and if you were to look at this teepee head-on I came from the left side the where it was I guess more away from this rocky area of this mountainous range but it was soft earth underneath and I was able to dig under the teepee and get under it and get myself under the flap and into this teepee or hut I I really think it's a teepee but if like I want to say it was more sturdy than that it was more um, a little more elaborate I guess but very simplistic at the same time and I remember telling her that I saw a fire and looking back at it now I probably got distracted by the fire or the fire surprised me that was in there and it was in the center of the structure and I got startled I heard a scream or like a surprised uh, yelp of some sort and that's when I knew like that I was looking for food and that's how I knew that there was food in there apparently there was a dog somewhere but the psychic sensitive asked me well how come you didn't choose the dog that would have been easier and I said no it wasn't enough energy it wasn't enough food for me and my child not enough food and so I actually what happened after being distracted by the fire I had turned and reacted to the noise that I had heard and got on top of this woman who was actually pregnant and that's why I chose her because she had more energy to sustain me and my child than the dog did and she goes well you must have known 
that this was a pretty risky move and I said yes, but I was so hungry. But as I got on top of this pregnant woman, I knew I was killing her, but at the same time when I was doing what I was doing, I got this flash in my mind of what I wanted to call a stick, which in reality was actually a spear coming down into my neck, down into my, my chest area. But I must have been stabbed at least once through the neck straight horizontally across. But the second, at least the second one into my, through my neck into my chest killed me. But I also killed the pregnant woman at the same time. And I got killed by another human who was the mother in that hut. I believe she wasn't in the hut at the time when I got in, but she must have heard the commotion that was happening and came in to defend her daughter. And that's how I died in that life. And I even got asked, well, you must have known, you know, there was usually more humans there. How many did you know that was there? And I said, three. But that's when I determined that the woman I had attacked was pregnant because there was only two adults there. Because I felt like I took two lives, but there was only one person. So on some level I knew that this, this woman was pregnant on some level, but also on another level, I needed more food, more energy for me and my child to make sure that we survived. And I got asked the question, well, what lesson did you learn from this life? And I said, just don't attack pregnant people. <laughs> and the, the realization of that is just the fact that like I knew at the time that I was making a mistake but at that time I didn't have any other choice there wasn't anything else around for me to be able to get if I had gotten the dog it wouldn't have been enough food I was if I got the dog it'd either be me or my child that lived the next day it wasn't gonna be the two of us so Upon inspection of the whole past life, what I looked like and what I resembled was, at first for a while I thought I was a saber-toothed tiger, but looking at it more closely, my, my sabers, I actually had sabers, but they weren't as long as a Smilodon's. In fact, I was what they call a scimitar cat. You could look this up. And when I looked up the scale of height sizes for these cats, the Smilodon stands just a bit shorter than a scimitar cat. And so the angle of what I was seeing these people at was the exact angle that they showed a height scale for the scimitar cat. I believe it's called a Homotherium cernum. I have to double check that later. I hope, hopefully, I um, describe that correctly. But my coat was definitely like a snow leopard's, like you would see in the Himalayan snow leopards, because it was also um, th this was the I would say the late ice age when these cats were starting to go extinct because. They hunted big game like mastodons and mammoths, really big creatures. So it also makes sense why I couldn't just go after the dog, that it wouldn't be enough food. I needed more energy at the time. And so 
these cats were built to be very swift and fast, but they also were built to have enough power to tackle these large game. But the, these uh, large game animals were disappearing. And so in order to go and hunt and get food, I would have had to go out two or three times more than I normally would in order to acquire food. And that just, the energy release ratio and acquirement ratio for the body just doesn't add up very well to a creature like that. So from what I understood, my, my family had died mostly from starvation. And if they didn't die from starvation, they died from either severe injury or illness. And my cub most likely passed away from me not being able to return with any food. And so my cub would have starved to death. And the way I see it is my action wasn't necessarily a bad action, but it was an action that at that point in time couldn't be avoided nor ignored and that I had tried my best to survive and that the humans were only doing what I was doing, surviving in a very harsh wilderness, very harsh environment. And I, looking back at it now, I'm pretty sure the dog was the one to alert them to my presence, at least the mother. And I don't know, maybe she went out to feed the dog or something and I had gotten under the tent and that that was the one moment, you know, the one moment that humans all say we turn away we turn away for a second and we look back and the person's not there or this awful thing is happening all because we turned away for a split second and that that was the situation that had happened and the one thing that I can really get from looking at this past life is that even though I was a cat, I was a very fearsome cat, I read up a bit about them too. Their, their sabers were double-edged, so both, both sides were edged, unlike the saber-toothed cat where just one side was serrated or edged. Um, the scimitar cats had both sides were serrated or edged for their sabers. So you can imagine this cat standing at hip to waist height level of a man with long legs, long neck, built for speed, built for, for taking on some pretty big game animals. It, it'd be really scary to wake up and see that in your face or in front of the fire inside your own home. So you can imagine the fear that these people felt when I was in there, which would be understandable as to why they would want to defend themselves. And also, it's obvious I I was at a point of desperation, which is what happens with a lot of predators that attack humans. Most of them are desperate or sick. Um, they don't always have the means to get food for themselves at, at how they normally would, so that's why they would turn to a person and attack a person. So the other thing you can walk away from this episode is if you are a victim of an animal attack, know that it's not anybody's fault, really. It, you just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Same thing for that animal. If you get attacked by, like, let's say a grizzly bear or a mountain lion or a wolf, there's something about that situation that you can understand more by the fact that when they see you, they, they are thinking the same thing you are thinking. How am I going to defend myself? How am I going to survive? 
what you know am i afraid of this person or or animal or are they afraid of me what's going on so all those things do go through the mind of that animal and the mind of that person because looking back at this life too from a feline perspective they do sense your emotions and to a certain degree that translates as thoughts to them so they do pick up on a whole bunch of things that you're quite unaware of and they feel everything from their paws to their fur to their whiskers everything feeds that information to them about you and what's going on with you they even sense energy so there's even videos and documentations and uh, even testimonials of people saying, hey, my, my cat cuddles on my stomach, you know, they must know I'm pregnant or something. Well, it's true. They do, they sense the extra energy. They just have this intuition that tells them, hey, there's another human here. Even though I can't see them, they must be inside of somebody. If that makes any sense to you whatsoever. So, basically, where I'm going with this is that cats in general, big, small, medium, ancient, modern, what have you, they pretty much feel things similarly and the same as any other cat. And it's just really unfortunate that when when humans get attacked by animals, it's usually... There's only a few things that you can guess as to why they got attacked, and some of those reasons are they're desperate for food. They can't find anything anywhere else in the area. They're hungry. They probably haven't eaten anything in a long time. So the human is probably the next best bet, especially if you're the kind of animal that's sick or unable to acquire food let's say how you normally would like like a wolf would go get a deer but sometimes if a wolf has an impairment like a sprained leg or injured leg or missing teeth or something like that it's gonna like impair them from catching that food and especially if they're not part of a pack they would definitely be resorting to some desperate measures I mean look at the lions of Savo in Africa look up that um, that story um, these two lions for whatever reason attacked a uh, construction area of a railroad and they became man-eaters and some say they were sick um, but they concluded that these were male lions with some kind of genetic uh, mutation of some sort where they didn't have manes, but they were male lions and they looked like female lions. And they definitely came from an area where those lions are known to be aggressive towards humans, quite aggressive. And so that coupled with needing to find food and there's only two of them, you can only imagine, you know, what would happen, especially when, during that time, they weren't, they weren't really exposed to humans like they are nowadays. So, during this time, this is when people were just starting to build railroads in Africa to get around. And this was something that was really new. And so, they're going through wild territory that they have no idea what's in there but they know they got to build a railroad and so these lions attack them and they go hey this is easy prey like you know we just come here and snatch one or two humans and get our meals and we come back tomorrow it's like going to mcdonald's or going to your refrigerator at your home and getting food whenever whenever and that's pretty much what that situation was like so that's all I can say is when you're out in the wilderness, definitely keep an eye out 
for animals that may be in the situation. I'm not saying carry food with you all the time because that could attract them to you, but what I'm trying to say is try to understand from their perspective. Um, don't blame them for attacking you. They're just doing what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to go about living their lives. You just happen to be there at the wrong place at the wrong time, just like they are, and not take it too personally, especially when you're in their environment, especially when you decide to go out hiking somewhere or even with sharks, when they attack people, you're in their environment. Uh, they don't, they can't leave the ocean to come to you and attack you. So that's why a lot of people that are victims of animal attacks, some people do say, you know, they don't blame the animal. They understand the animal is just doing what they were meant to be doing, like bears protecting their cubs. They'll attack people left and right. And that's why they will always tell you to keep a distance from animals, especially bison. They look nice and cute and cuddly, but they're aggressive too because they have to be. They have to be aggressive against bears and wolves and coyotes and, and wolverines and what have you. So looking back at this past life memory, I, I also would like to say that um, I do feel like I don't blame the human for killing me. Um, I just feel like the only part of that it feels is that I've had to, what they do for the healing is you cast off all the negative emotions and thoughts that's there. You cast it away from you and say you no longer need it because in this life you are not in that body anymore and having that life but I don't blame the human for killing me if anything I have to say that the time of my death I regretted killing that woman because I did kill her baby too and that it was a waste of a life for me to kill them and not be able to take them back and use them to feed my cub and also I get the sense that they didn't eat me um, they probably skinned me and used my body like my pelt but that's the sense that I got from that time and so I don't really blame them if anything I knew it was a mistake but it was an unavoidable mistake at the time. So I don't blame the human. I don't feel like they entirely blame me. If anything, they only blame me for the death of one of their own. And so I believe in time they probably did forgive me. Probably because in time they probably saw that there wasn't as many uh, cats like me around anymore and so it probably made sense to them over time that you know something was wrong with me and there's a reason why I I went boldly inside a tent and attacked somebody so that's how I feel like back then people they were very very afraid of the dark and very afraid of the unknown because at nighttime that's when the predators would roam so dogs helped save them from the unknown and the dangers of that wilderness. But at the same time, they had enough compassion in their hearts and kindness in their hearts to realize that, you know, not all animals are considered evil, that things do happen for a reason in this lifetime, even though we don't fully understand the reasons why. And I believe that's also why humans developed more of a spiritual need for understanding back then. So, if there's anything you want to take away from this, it's what's it like to be a ancient feline in the time of what's considered to be the towards the end of the Ice Age and what it's like to deal with humans as an animal. 
And I hope you enjoyed this past life. This was the first one that I went over. And I will release more episodes the more lives I unlock. I do have about four total right now. This is one of them. But solely I'll be going over each past life. Um, this one, I have to say, at the time of my session, it was the most emotional, the most traumatic for me. Um, I was pretty hesitant about going into that tent when I was really looking at it, but I was encouraged to, you know, if I wanted to unveil the darkness is what it's called, which is the block that's preventing you from seeing what you don't want to see. And you do have the option, you, you have the option to uncover it or leave it alone. And at the end of your past life uh, session for each book, you do have the option to see if you can change the outcome or leave it as is. Most of my past lives, I choose to leave them as is because they are lessons in themselves. But upon your choice of altering what you could do about what happened, um, I believe it's more of in terms of trying to come in terms of understanding of what happened, why, and maybe what you should have done instead. But I feel like most of the things that I did, um, I didn't want to change them because they had a lesson in themselves to tell me in this life, this life that I have. And I'll admit it, um, being an animal is much easier than being human. Um, it's much more freeing, it's much more liberating, and it's much more, I have to use the word pure. Um, you just live life like how you're supposed to. Humans don't normally get to be that way. Modern humans are bound by job, money, rules, laws, what say you, and we inflict our own cages upon ourselves, if that makes any sense. So, that is one life, and I hope that this was a treat for you to listen to. I will be, um, producing some more episodes soon. Uh, I'm just doing whatever I feel comfortable producing at the moment right now, but once I have more content for you, I will release it. You'll know in the Moon Medicine server, and thank you for listening. I am Soul. This is the end of, end of this episode. And so I look forward to seeing what you guys have to say about this episode or any previous ones or uh, any questions you might have that's greatly appreciated. Feel free to voicemail me on Anchor. You can find the Moon Medicine Force on Spotify and CastBox as well. Don't forget to join the Discord server. We'd be welcome to have you on there. We cover pretty much everything. Cryptids, aliens, spirituality, uh, demons, angels, ghosts, and psychic experiences. We cover as much as we can. And if I don't know much about it, you have a couple people that are members that might be able to help you understand more. And I'm glad to document my first past life that I saw. And I'll be going over my next ones in uh, future episodes. So, thanks guys. Don't forget to follow share this episode with your friends or family or whoever's interested in this kind of stuff and i look forward to seeing you again thanks for listening toodles <laughs>